Uh, welcome to Coffee with Job on Tuesday. We are going to consider today whether we actually matter to God, whether what we do makes any difference. Um, we're in chapter 22 of Job and Eliphaz is replying to Job. And the, the whole of chapter 22, by the way, we're going to look at it in three parts, but the the whole of chapter 22, in one sense, is an almost brilliant sermon. And by the way, thank you to those of you who've responded to this, uh, even on the YouTube chat or uh, with Vimeo or just writing me. I really, really, really do appreciate it. Even those of you who just strongly disagree with things, that's fine. But let's read this. Verse 1. Then Eliphaz the Temanite replied, Can a man be a benefit to God? Can even a wise person benefit him? What pleasure would it give the Almighty if you were righteous? What would he gain if your ways were blameless? Is it for your piety that he rebukes you and brings charges against you? Is not your wickedness great? Are not your sins endless? You demanded security from your relatives for no reason. You stripped people of their clothing, leaving them naked. You gave no water to the weary and you withheld food from the hungry. Though you were a powerful man, owning land, an honored man living on it, and you sent widows away empty-handed and broke the strength of the fatherless. That is why snares are all around you, why sudden peril terrifies you, why it's so dark that you cannot see, and why a flood of water covers you. That's an extraordinary speech in so many ways from Eliphaz. You know, I've been thinking about this. I've been thinking about how people say things. Now, please don't misunderstand me here. They say things that are right theologically and sound, and yet in context, they can do so much harm. People say, well, if you're speaking the truth, you're saying things that are right, so what? But I was thinking about this as well, people who preach the gospel or preach about the gospel, but don't really preach the gospel. And that's because they preach it out of context. The context of the people, they, they give the wrong application. The word needs to be applied, not misapplied. So here's Eliphaz speaking his mind. He's speaking in one sense, very correct doctrine, but he goes from the doctrine to accusation, an accusation of particular sins that are very, very hard for Job to answer. Job was a rich man and he's saying there are poor people and you didn't feed them and you didn't do this and you didn't do that. Now, as it will turn out when we get to chapter 31, as, or as we've already been told in chapters 1 and 2, Job was a righteous man who did these things. But, you know, I, I do wonder if, what it's like to be unjustly accused and if that's ever happened to you, because it's a bit like someone said, you're so proud and arrogant. If you go, no, I'm not proud, that's proud, isn't it? It's so hard to answer these. But what struck me about this particular thing was, can a man be of benefit to God? Well, what's the answer to that? Eliphaz is coming from a position of, well, nothing affects God and God can do whatever he wants and why does God need you? He doesn't need you. But it does matter to God how Job is. You can see how the devil has come to God and accused Job of only worshipping God because of what God has given him. And it's a matter of God's honor that Job stands. And that's what it, sin is. Sin is against God. Sin grieves God. The Holy Spirit can be grieved. We are to live for the glory of God. It's a phenomenal responsibility. I think Romans chapter 8, you know, tells us that we can live. And I think the whole New Testament is talking about how we, and the Old Testament, talking about how we are to live for the glory of God. So can we be a benefit to God? Yes, you know, in his grace and mercy, we can. We can worship him. We can serve him. We can glorify him. I hope and pray that you will do so. I am going to tag on just now a little clip that is from the latest Ask podcast with Gerald Bray. I just want to commend his book to you on the history of Christianity. Um, listen to the podcast as well. I think you'll, I hope you find it as stimulating as I did. 
Um, here's a wee clip, and I'll see you tomorrow. Bye. Yeah. Uh, maybe you can help me with something as well. In, in terms of how Christianity spread, we, we know mm -hmm. it spread through the preaching of the word, you know, prayer, the example, and so on. And there's an argument about using force. And I remember when I was studying uh, Viking history, uh, mm -hmm. reading the Orkneyinga saga, mm -hmm. and there's a marvelous line which I've, I've cited in evangelism classes. It talks about um, Eric Bloodaxe and Thorfinn Skullsplitter, who just are wonderful mm -hmm. characters, uh, mm -hmm. going to Magnus, Earl of Orkney, I think, mm -hmm. uh, and saying to him, the saga goes, they threaten him, they say, we're going to steal your cattle, burn your houses, take your women, um, unless you become Christian. And it ends up, the, the great line at the end is, and so all Orkney was baptised. <laughs> um, it's, you know, um, how, how do you comment about something like that, you know? Well, I think, uh, yes, I mean, th this kind of thing was actually quite common, um, uh, you know, in, the, in in what you might call the, the conversion of the barbarians uh, uh, of Northern Europe. I mean, not just in Scotland, but also in uh, in France and Germany and other places. Um, I think you have to, to say, well, you, you know, as in, in all things like this, um, you have to start where the people are. And, and the, the, the people who did this kind of thing, you know, Eric, Blood Axe, whatever, this is the way they thought. This is the way they lived. This, this is something they would have done um, for anything. Um, uh, you know, you, you go along with us or else, you know, that's the end of you. Um, this, this would be a fairly standard approach to their whole existence. And I think that the truth of the matter is um, that over time the church um, modified this, changed this. Uh, and where you see it is uh, in, for example, um, the legends of King Arthur. Um, mm -hmm. You know, where, where, where knightly chivalry was exalted and um, the, the sort of, you know, testosterone-fueled uh, uh, warriors were, were transformed into um, warriors for Christ. Now, I mean, this may not be something that we would do today, uh, but uh, given the circumstances of the time, um, you know, it was a kind of uh, transformation over time of this, uh, producing a kind of idealism, um, uh, you know, that uh, I suppose fed into the Crusades eventually and things like this. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, you don't you don't get away uh, from violence and, uh, and so on completely, um, but the church moved moved in that direction. It moved towards um, uh, changing things, and you see this in many ways. I mean, um, the church was largely responsible for modifying and eventually abolishing slavery, mm -hmm. um, for example. Uh, the church was responsible for. Uh, raising the status of women um, in, in matrimony uh, by insisting that the parties to a, to a marriage should should consent, um, and the idea that the woman you know could not be married unless she gave her her consent, um, which we would take for granted today, um, was almost unheard of, um, you know, in pre-Christian times because you, mm -hmm. you you did what your parents told you to do, and that was that. Um, so. Although these things didn't change overnight and, uh, you know, it did take time, um, the church was moving in this direction and, um, the, you know, gradually sort of domesticating, if you like, the, the violence and so on um, that you would find in an earlier time. Um, so that's what I would say. Not, don't judge by the first generation. Um, look what happened over, you know, the, the subsequent centuries. I think that's extreme.